That's what I wanted to bring to you guys tonight, is to think about what is your unfair competitive advantage. So there, there's a couple ways to look at that. I think a cool way to look at it is, let's look at Las Vegas. Um, you know, we've, we've been investing in companies in Silicon Valley for five or six years now. LA, we see a lot of deals there, we invest there. New York, Stockholm, China, we, we, we see thousands of deals a year. Um, we invest in five or ten a year. We've seen probably a couple hundred startups in, in Las Vegas. The one thing that I'm always just a little bit worried about, we actually haven't invested in a single company in, in Las Vegas yet. I really want that to change. I really want to be able to do more deals in Las Vegas. But the problem I have with it is a lot of times people here are building an app that I've already seen in Silicon Valley that you're going to go sell it to Facebook. I can walk out of our office in Silicon Valley, walk two blocks, and go have a meeting with 10 people at Facebook. How how are you guys going to sell to Facebook here? The interesting thing about Las Vegas is there's all these amazing advantages to, to Las Vegas that the startups here are not always taking advantage of. You know, if you if you look at Switch, they're a great example of, of taking advantage of Las Vegas. This is the best climate to build a data center in. You're right next to a dam, plenty of power coming over here. You know, there's land here, plenty of land to build a data center. So you know, Rob Roy took his competitive advantage of Las Vegas and turned it into something perfect that could only be started here. Nobody in Silicon Valley is going to be able to replicate this. And I would love to see more things come out of even this weekend that thinks about what, what do you have in Vegas? You, you have you know, the Switch ecosystem, you have the Zappos ecosystem, you have the gaming industry. There, there's a lot of interesting things here that the rest of the world is not at an advantage with. Um, that, that's one side of it. Or, or think about your own experiences. You know, what is it that is going to give you a, a, a one-up? So that's why I started Originate. You know, we anybody can start a fund. You know, you have enough successes you can put together a fund. I wanted a fund that when we gave somebody money, we had a competitive advantage because we're Originate. So how did I do that? So the only thing I'm really great at is software, and so I hired all the best developers that I, I could find, and we just we, we put together a process for building amazing software. So when we invest in a company, we also put people in to help write the software, and that gives us an advantage. We know we're not going to screw up the software. We may screw up the whole rest of the deal and bet on the wrong company and bet on the wrong market, and, and that's the risk of venture, but we have a little bit of an advantage there. So. So that's kind of the challenge I want to give you guys, and, and um, think, think through that. And with that, I will reveal the list that the, uh, that the investment team put right on the top of this internal purposes only. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, we really look at 10 things. Um, and like I said, we, we see probably across the seven offices, maybe even 400, 500 pitches a month. So I've, I've seen a lot of pitches. You, you get more and more skeptical of pitches, so you, you have to have a, a good mindset here. So I, I've pushed myself back into enjoying listening to pitches again. So, but I especially enjoy pitches that cover these things well. So the, uh, the first one is, and any business plan, any pitch deck we take, we put it into this format. So everything we look at as a company, as a fund, is, is the same. The first point is, what is your purpose? Why are you starting a company? And it's not the problem you're solving, it's not your solution, it's not all that, it's why are you doing this? Why are you an entrepreneur? Why are you trying to have fun? Are you trying to become a billionaire? Are you trying to save the world? Are you trying to work with smart people? Like, what is it that drives you? That, to us, that's almost one of the biggest indicators of success. If you don't have a real purpose for what you're doing, if you're like, if your purpose is you know, just to make money and you don't care how you do it, there's a lot of other people out there that have a, a better purpose than that related to what they're doing. So know your purpose. So once you know your purpose, second thing we look at is the problem. You know, what, what is the problem you're trying to solve? So many people approach us with a solution 
And they're like, well, I'm sure this solves a problem out there. We just need to find the problem. We built this cool technology. There must be a problem that it solves. Start with the problem. And a really great problem is a problem that you actually have yourself. You know, all, all my favorite startups, we, we've had four or five good um, exits so far. Almost all of those, I was like, yeah, that actually solves a problem that I have too. And no better expert about a problem is, is yourself if you've experienced it. So, so pick a problem that you're, you're passionate about solving. And then the third one is, is the solution, obviously. How, how are you going to solve it? Not the technology, not the user experience, not all that yet. But what is the solution? You know, there's, there's, you know, there's problems out there, and there's crazy solutions that don't even involve technology, and there's, there's really tangible solutions. But think about, is this a solution you would actually use? Or, or if not, can you prove that people would actually use this type of solution to the problem? The purpose, the problem, the solution, and then this one is kind of luck sometimes, but you can you can manufacture luck a little bit. And this one is timing. Is this the right timing? And a lot of people don't think about this. You know, I can't tell you how many times I hear, nobody's thought of this yet. Impossible. Everybody's thought of everything. Um, why is now the right time though to solve it? If, if people have failed in the past, why did they fail? What is different about the time? What is different about the world now? that will make this successful. Or are you too early? You know, a lot of times you, you may be way ahead of your time, and we see a lot of that, where this is a great idea, a great problem, a great solution. You know, if, if you're worried that robots are going to attack you and that's the problem and your solution is a robot force field, pretty good company in 50 years, maybe. You know, it's a little, a little early. All right, so make sure your timing is right. Um, and then the third, the fifth one here is market size. Is can you can you actually find more than a few people that will want this solution at this current time? And there's, you know, another thing I hear a lot is, you know, there's 300 million people, and each one of them are going to give us a dollar a month, and this is going to be huge. You know, you, you need to narrow it down. What is your total addressable market? How many people could conceivably even be in this space that has this problem? What's your total market that you could actually get to, bottom up? If I called 100 people a day and I assumed half of them said yes and they all bought it, you know, how many people could you really get to? And what is that? So make sure there's actually people out there that... that um, number six, uh, this one is, is my favorite. Competition. Don't ever pitch me and say, nobody is doing this. There is no competition. That either means it's a really bad idea or it means you have not Googled it. You know, like I've literally sat down and people have been like, nobody else is doing this. And I'll like literally type in their sentence they gave me about what they're doing and like five of them pop up to like, well, those weren't there last week. <laughs> know your competition, you know, and, and beyond that, know why you're different. That's great if you have competition. I love competition. It, it, gives you, it gives you somebody to crush. It's not fun to have a company where you're the only one like carving out a new space and then you get crushed later because somebody did it a little better. Go crush somebody and then... In a space. Nothing wrong with that, but know who they are. Go make friends with them too. I have meetings with, with all of my portfolio companies' competition all the time. Share information and, and they'll give you information back. There's plenty of market out there if you, if you did number five right. There, there's market to share and you'll learn more from your competition than you will um, if you don't talk to them. Um, it's a good thing. All right, then you get down to the product. The solution is not the same as the product. What is the product you're gonna build? Is it an app? Is it a website? Is it you know, Google Glasses plugin? You know, is it a robot? You know, figure out what is the product. And everybody talks about MVP, and, and I don't know, to start up, we can still focus around the MVP. I personally hate the word MVP. I, I don't know what it means anymore. You know, we have people coming in saying, okay, we need to raise $5 million so we can get to an MVP. Minimal viable product. Minimal viable product, it doesn't make sense. So we've, we've switched over to think about problem solving products. Pick the top thing on your list of your problem that you made and pick the easiest solution to it and build that first. Just find a product that solves one problem well and a full product and see what happens. See if you can sell it, see if people use it, see if it actually is a viable business. And to me, that, that's an easier first step. Doesn't mean you have to 
put it out to the world and, and this is your company, but it, it means it's something you can go out and actually test on a certain amount of people. So figure out your product. Um, and then once you have that, it's the business model. This is my least favorite part of it. I didn't get an MBA. Um, my partners have their MBAs. We have a lot of people at, on the investment team I stole this from with their MBAs. It's great. Listen, listen to everybody with their MBA. Learn from them. If you spend all your time writing a business model instead of code, I probably won't, won't respect you as much. Go, go write some code and prove that it actually works. But think about your pricing. Think about how you're going to sell it. Think about if you're going to be able to make money. You know, the first thing my partner Jeff will ask you, how are you going to make money? And the world is shifting. We're in a bubble, especially in Silicon Valley. We, we hear things like, oh, don't worry about the revenue model. Just go get users. I've heard these things before. I heard these things in 99 and 2000, and we know where that, that led. So figure out how you're going to make money. If you're making money, you're always a business, regardless if you're in a bubble. All right, number nine is the team. Once you figure out what you want to do, the team is really, really important. I mean, I would argue your team that you start a business with or run a business with is more important than who you marry, more important than your best friend. This is, this is really important. If you're a true entrepreneur, this is your real marriage here. This is your, your business partner. It's really bad if, if you guys break up. That, that will destroy not only your business, but everybody's lives that you hired not just your kids, so th th this is a big trickle down here. So, so take this part seriously. Find a team that you want to spend a lot of time with. See what they're like when they're really happy. See what they're like when you push them the wrong way. You know, the, I'll, I'll tell you, the company that I, I started and, and sold in 2006, um, one of my best friends was, was one of my co-founders there, and it literally ripped us a, apart for a long period of time. Um, not because things were going bad, but because things were going really well. It's interesting to see how people change when there's millions of dollars on the table um, and, and you have to make some tough decisions there. So, so get to know your team well. Make sure that you fill all the gaps of the things you need to do. You can only, only outsource so much, but um, that, that's important. And then, yeah, finally, your, your financials, your pitch. How are you going to raise money? What are you going to do with the money? All, all of that good stuff. You know, that's, that, that's what we'll ask you at the end of liking your team, liking your problem, liking your solution, liking all that is, is what do you want from us? If I give you half a million dollars and a team of three engineers for six months, what are you going to do with that? And why, why should we give it to you and not the other three people that have probably pitched us the exact same thing? You know, what, what's, what's your unfair competitive advantage? That's, that's going to make us want to give this to you. So that's my pitch. Find your unfair competitive advantage, figure out why Vegas, and give me some companies here that we can invest in in Vegas, and I'll be happy. So.